When we specify a latent variable model that contains different contexts, it is important to establish measurement invariants between those contexts. In other words, if we model things over time, we want to be sure that our measurement model works the same way in all time points. The same thing applies to when we collect data from different contexts. For example, if we do cross-cultural research, we collect data from five different countries, we want to be sure that the scale works the same way in all those countries so we can attribute any differences between the results to differences in the phenomenon instead of differences in how the scale works. Work. Measurement invariance has different levels and the required level depends on the purpose of the analysis. The first level is configural invariance and this simply means that if we estimate the same factor model in different contexts does the same model fit well. So we don't need to have correlated errors in one context or cross loadings in one context but not another context. So this is simply a model testing and there is nothing special about it. The actual invariance testing sequence then follows a weak factorial invariance. The idea of weak factorial invariance is that we test do the scales plausibly measure the same thing on the same scale. In practice we constrained factorial loadings to be the same across the occasions or across the context. Then when we move on we take a look at a strong factorial invariance. The idea of strong factorial invariance is that we look at the item intercepts and we, we ask if the differences in the item means could be attributed to the differences in the latent variables or the attributes being measured instead of being just differences in how the items work across different contexts. And then we have a strict factorial invariance which is not typically used when we look at how the error variances behave across different contexts. But this is not normally required and typically not normally tested. So how does the testing sequence actually work? Let's take a look at the example from Little. And this example is a bit unconventional in how the latent variables are scaled. So typically we scale the latent variables by fixing the first factor loading to be one and fixing the latent variables mean to be zero. In this case, however, the scaling of the variance is done by constraining the mean of the factor loadings to one. So instead of constraining a specific factor loading, we constrain the mean of the factor loadings to be one. The same thing with the intercepts, instead of constraining the latent variable mean to be zero and estimating the intercepts, we estimate the latent variable's mean and we identify the mean by constraining these intercepts to be zero on average. This is not common, but it's um, one way to deal with the problem that how, how do we pick which of these indicators is our scaling indicator and how do we uh, pick which one of these variables is our reference indicator for the mean which we need to have for some longitudinal models. So the configure invariance model basically fits a normal converter factor analysis to the data. We look at whether the model fits well and whether we need to do any modifications and are same modifications needed for first two time points. Typically in longitudinal studies configure invariance holds if the scale is well developed. So configure invariance simply will look at whether the model fits well, no, no additional constraints. Then when we go to the uh, weak factorial invariance, we look at whether the factor loadings can be the same. So that basically establishes uh, the sc scale for the variance of the latent variables for, for both of these latent variables. And to do that, we constrain these loadings to be the same across occasions. So the first loading is the same as the first loading here, the second loading is the same as second loading there, and the third loadings are the same. So this is the weak factorial invariance. If these would, factor loadings would be widely different, then we couldn't, wouldn't be able to conclude that this um, difference is in variances or, or this correlation is actually, or covariance is actually a, a valid estimate of the covariance between the trades.
because it could be that these measures simply work differently so that they are less related to the concept they measured than in the first time period. Then we have the strong factorial invariance. In the strong factorial invariance we constrain these intercepts to be the same across all cases. Typically we would constrain the first intercept to be zero that is our reference intercept and then these uh, second and third intercept would be estimated constrained to be the same and we would also estimate the latent variable means. So this is the strong factor of invariance and it answers the question can we attribute differences in levels in the latent variables to the uh, differences in, in the trade being measured or is it possible that is simply that these, these scales work differently in different contexts. In practice if we simply take let's say there are the mean of these items and the mean of these items. The mean at the second occasion could be higher for example because this happy indicator would be uh, have a higher mean and cheerful and glad indicator would have the same mean as before and that would be evidence for simply this happy indicator reacting to difference in over time and not all the indicators. If all the indicators change by the same amount in their means then that is evidence for a change in, in positive effect. If simply one indicator changes in, in the mean, then that is evidence for the scale working differently across these different contexts. So uh, the idea of strong factor invariance is that if these indicators change over time, they change in the same way. And that is evidence for change in the actual trade being measured instead of uh, being evidence for differences in the measurement process. In practice we compare these models using nested model testing. So this is a sequence of tests. We start with the unconstrained factor analysis model, the configure invariance. We add the constraint to the loadings to do the weak, in, weak factor invariance. And if we need a strong factor model then we add constraints to the intercept. We do nested model sequence. There, is, uh, there are two ways that are recommended in the literature. One is the chi-square test. Another one is, is rule of thumb uh, of, and CFI. If CFI is more than 0 0.02 uh, lower than in the previous model, then we uh, say that the models are different. If CFI difference is less than 0 0.02, we conclude that the models fit equally well. This is difficult to recommend. This, the chi-square is actually what you need. And if the chi-square rejects your model, then you need to consider, okay, so what is the degree of difference? If you have a sample size of thousands, then trivially small differences will be co concluded as statistically significant because 0.001 is different from zero in the population. And, but whether it makes a difference, then you need to interpret if the factual loadings are, are similar enough, even though they are not identical and make a call. Sometimes you don't have exactly a measure, uh, exactly perfect measurement invariance, then you need to explain what that means in your particular study context. So to summarize, we need measurement invariance when we have multiple different contexts. So we have multiple groups or we have repeated measurements over time. What level is required? Configuring is always required so you estimate the same factor model for both occasions or both contexts. Weak is for comparing effects. Strong is for comparing uh, levels. Strict typically not required. And how we go about testing measurement invariance is that we start from the uh, configure model and we go to the more constrained models. We compare always against the previous model because these are nested models using the likelihood ratio test. So which one do you require in practice? So there are rules of thumb. One is if you have a model of time, so you are interested in, in change over time, then you need strong invariance because you want to attribute the changes in the means of the indicators to the changes in the, in the trade or the latent variable that you measure instead of differences in how the items work across different contexts. If you want to study dynamic models or, or compare effects from, from one context to another, then you need uh, just weak factor invariance. For example, if you want to uh, study 
whether happiness and sadness are correlated more in Europe versus in the States, then you would need a uh, weak factorial invariance. So whether your uh, interest is in correlations or effects or whether your interest is in the level differences determines whether you need strong or weak factorial invariance.